Once upon a time, video games were distributed on little, flat, rewritable platters, and you weren't likely to have a computer in your house. What did likely have a computer was your school, which probably had one and a bunch of stuff on it, with those platters. If it was anything like my school, it had things on it like word processing software and spreadsheet software and ugly desktop publishing software that didn't use a mouse. And then, of course, the true gems. It probably had some video games. And those video games were probably ones that required no copy protection, because even schools pirated software. In the period of the early 90s, the preserved in amber school PC often had some reliable mainstays of educational games. And amongst those, the good ones, the real good ones, were the Super Solvers games by The Learning Company. Chances are, if you recognize that name, you know some of the games it includes. Odds are, unless you're a super dork like me and maybe looked it up, you don't know all the Super Solvers games, and maybe you even find yourself wondering, hey, were they any good? What even was in the Super Solvers franchise? What about that one? Why did it feel weird compared to the others? It's a little bit of a challenge to properly nail this down. The most comprehensive list are Treasure Mountain, Midnight Rescue, Outnumbered, Challenge of the Ancient Empires, Spellbound, Gizmos and Gadgets, Mission Think, and Operation Neptune. On the other hand, you could shorten the list to Midnight Rescue through to Mission Think, excluding Treasure Mountain and Operation Neptune. Of course, if you're including Treasure Mountain, there are four more treasure games, Treasure Mountain, Treasure Math Storm, Treasure Cove, and Treasure Galaxy. So why are they excluded? And what about Time Riders in American History, which sure, feels like a Super Solver game, though it also feels a bit like a Carmen San Diego game? We'll talk more about it later, but the actual Super Solvers branding jumping around like this is a byproduct of a period of PC gaming where games were re-released a surprising amount. During the floppy disk era, it was extremely cheap to re-release a game. The floppy disk was basically a fungible storage system, which meant that if a game failed to sell, you recalled its boxes and manual, then use the discs to sell another game. Or you could even rewrite or recompile the game to make changes and then use the same discs to send it out again. It meant that the cost of a new version of a game could be very low compared to console games at the time, or even CD printed games. This meant for some companies in this space that had the pre-existing distribution networks, it was better to have a wide library of possible games, even more than you could necessarily easily distribute. Release a game, release it again, and every time some of them sold. That's why Treasure Mountain started as a Super Solver game and Operation Neptune didn't, and in later re-releases they were changed. For me, the Super Solvers games start at Treasure Mountain and conclude at Gizmos and Gadgets, the last one I played. I wasn't there properly when the games were new. When I was paying attention, the games were already well proliferated, pirated and shared. For me, the games were present more or less at the same time, and I explored them at my own pace, which, as it so happened, coincided with me finding the specific things each game was doing interesting and challenging. I played Mission Think a little bit, but I remember at the time being unimpressed with how much like Gizmos and Gadgets played. I would have collected footage of it and refreshed myself on how it plays, except Mission Think was a CD-ROM game and just a little bit more difficult to play than the other games. Follow along then with my journey that starts with Treasure Mountain. Americans are always talking about Oregon Trail as the great enduring challenge of the school computers. Those Americans were missing out. Oh, sure, you could call one of your settlers poop and hilariously die of dysentery in a game that wasn't very challenging, but mostly taught a student to pay attention to a small number of competing needs. It also looked like ass, which is not unreasonable considering its age since it came out in 1985. The real treasure of the school computer for people who were still building basic literacy skills was Treasure Mountain, the 1990 game that introduced players to the ageless, faceless, gender-neutral, culturally ambiguous adventure person, and the ongoing villain of the story, Morty Maxwell the master of mischief. In Treasure Mountain, there's this mountain, right? And uh, it has treasures. But one day, Morty Maxwell steals all the treasures, then hides them all around the place, which is a weird way to handle your thieving. You, a super solver, 
Super Seeker in later revisions of the Treasure Games, are tasked to recover the treasures and topple Morty Maxwell. You do this by climbing the mountain, which you do in the most unnecessarily ornate method. See, to get up the mountain, you need to unlock a set of gates that take you further up. Each gate has a key, and each key is hidden on levels of the mountain. To find the key, you have to find the clues that lead to the key, which is hidden behind a single entity identified by three unique words, two adjectives and a noun. Like two red flags, or three square bushes, that kind of thing. When you find one, you throw a gold coin down on it, and hey, there if you found it, you're on the right spot, and you can go. To get the clues, you need to catch elves in a net. Yeah, they're elves, but they're the short little gnomey ones, not the tall, elegant Mr. Anderson types, and answer their questions. If you answer the question right, you get a clue. If the elf doesn't have a clue, they just give you some gold and whoosh off, which makes the whole net arrangement feel a touch like a shakedown. It's not a complicated or challenging game per se. As you move around the mountain, you don't get battered by hazards or lose access to things or chased by stuff. There are even mechanics to help you catch up if you accidentally lose all your resources. Nets can be turned into coins, coins can be turned into nets, and the exchange rate between them is pretty forgiving. Once you have all the keys and any number of the treasures, you break into the castle, climb a ladder, dethrone Morty Maxwell, temporarily, stick your treasures into storage, then jump down a slide and start it all over again. Look, this game is a game for babies. It is not a challenging game on its own as it is. Everything about it is extremely basic, infinitely iterative, and the result of any given trip up the mountain is a number of treasures on a path to the end of the game, then back down to the start. You can regard the game as finished when you do one loop up the mountain, or you treat the end of the game as when you attain the highest rank and therefore have to do the play loop at least 30 times. Thing is, you can make it challenging. You can make it challenging if what you care about is finishing it quickly. If you care about being able to get the treasures and keys as quickly as possible, making educated guesses, trying to make it up to the top with as few clues as possible, and while minimizing your unnecessary loops around the mountain's circular levels, this game for children presents you with a game where the only measure of success becomes a race against yourself and anyone else doing the same thing. What I'm saying is Treasure Mountain is a speedrunner's game. I didn't play most of the treasure games aside from Mountain. Officially, these games are Super Seeker games, you know, the not cool, aloof solver games. This one was made for babies. The treasure games are much simpler, but they're also a lot more similar than the other games in the franchise. So if you've played Treasure Mountain, you've played most of the Seekers. Midnight Rescue and Outnumbered. Okay, I promise there's a reason to lump these two games together, and it's more than just that the two games follow a very similar template and were released at around the same time. In each case, these games are about your character being trapped in a closed environment with a timer with a limited resource for defending yourself as you are hunted by something that you have to face to escape. It's an educational game, but the tension to it is unexpected. These games follow most of the same systems as Treasure Mountain under the hood. In Outnumbered, you're moving around a local TV station that is under lockdown thanks to a pair of robots. One of them can't be reasoned with, and the other appears out of nowhere and chases you until you do its math problems. Thing is, you need to do some of those math problems to get the clues necessary to work out where the villain is hiding. In Midnight Rescue, you're in the local elementary school that is under lockdown thanks to a number of robots. They will appear at random points around you, chasing you down the halls or trying to impede you from getting clues, and if they hit you, they will burn the remaining time you have. Thing is, you need to photograph these robots or you won't be able to deduce where the villain is hiding. These two games are so very simple and operate on the same principles, which is why it's kind of remarkable that whenever I brought them up around any fellow gamers while we rubbed each other's feet, they were all united in the same reaction to these two games. These games are so fucking scary. Yeah, I don't know why. Maybe it's a byproduct of the clunky, grindy audio, the way the game makes it very clear you have no alternative but to confront these robots, the surprisingly demanding reaction times or whatever, but somehow what stood out to the audience at large is that Outnumbered and Midnight Rescue are games that as far as genre markers go are horrifying. You might scoff at it now, and well, that's reasonable because you're at least 14 years old or you wouldn't be here, right? But much in the same way that millennial culture has all these odd touchstones of remembering TV shows with surprisingly dark twists, it seems that if you were in the cohort that got to remember these games at all, you remembered them not for how they taught you reading skills or inductive reasoning, but instead how freaking scary it was to be chased by an angry television that wants you to do math. 
Challenge of the Ancient Empires. Now this is the good stuff. Morty Maxwell is back at it again, having gone to a number of what I guess must be archaeological sites around the world, stolen a bunch of important relics, then scattered the results all over the same ancient world, which is a bad thing to do. Much worse than stealing a bunch of important relics and taking them to England. They're Return the Elgin Marbles, you sponging assholes. Anyway, you travel through four ancient territories, Greece and Rome, the Middle East, India and China, and Egypt. Each of those locations has a themed set of puzzles that include some bits and pieces of the culture they're from, like how the Greek and Rome puzzles show you Greek characters, and how China is defined by using conveyor belts to move past enormous Pez-spitting insects. You finish these four worlds, you get an extra long-form world that mixes all the mechanics together, and then at the end, that you have to ring a gong while a probably Indian goddess of some variety tries to kill you. Morty Maxwell enters the finds out stage of things here and he fucking dies. That's right, boom, turn to stone, the stone cracks, dude is now a decorative zen garden. Then you come back and do it again on expert mode. The Challenge of the Ancient Empires is one of those super solver games that doesn't compare easily to another game. While most of the others have sort of sibling games modeled on similar engines and play patterns, Ancient Empires is a puzzle platformer game. That's all it is too. There's no elaborate bending of the game to try and make educational content happen. It's just the game is made up of three types of basic puzzle. Platforming puzzles, where you move around and press buttons and work conveyor belts and button sequences, that kind of thing. Then you need to do a jigsaw puzzle. Then you solve a little logic puzzle and it's off to the next stage of the game. The game is honestly really good, just solid all around in game factors. There are some things that don't look or feel great, the jumping can be a bit squeezed, the inconsistent behavior of the light helmet not stopping certain kinds of enemies is annoying, and there are times where you might be left not sure if you should be able to make a jump or not, or you should be using your force field to get past something. It's also a game where you can fail and lose progress and have to reset, which can be frustrating for tiny and easily frustrated children, or ordinarily sized, ordinarily frustrated children, or large, extremely easily frustrated adults. There's a narrative that Ancient Empires started its life as a normal puzzle game and was branded into the Super Solvers after a certain point, which may explain why Morty Maxwell is basically absent and the game doesn't work the way that any of its predecessors do and is instead just a garden variety interesting puzzle game. It holds up even. Go check it out if you're a DOSBox type. Hell, you can play it in browser and it'll keep you entertained for a lunch or two. There's a greater message here about how we regard the safety and provenance of important historical artifacts and how in fact the safest place for historical items to be for future preservation is in the ground where nobody's touching them. The vision of the explorer here does see the tombs and chambers of these ancient empires as being things that we want to enter and which are full of still living and still dangerous things that we are trying to navigate because the things they are protecting and doing a very good job of protecting are too important to leave where the people who owned them and cared about them chose to put them. I get it, I am kind of saying that archaeology is inherently bad, but let's just say that there are better routes to doing it than the reason you can go to the British Museum and seeing the Amvarati collection from India. Spellbound. Now, if you've been paying keen attention, you might have noticed the way that the game so far have all progressed kind of cleanly across technological lines. Midnight Rescue and Outnumbered work very similarly, implying the same game engine with different assets and ideas, and all the visuals are 16 color EGA. Ancient Empires, you have the more varied 256 colors of EGA in a higher resolution. There were technological developments that each game got to play with because they'd become available. In the case of Spellbound, it seems the technological development was the presence of the sound card. It's so important you could buy the game with an ad-lib sound card as a bundle. In Spellbound, the, um, yeah, let, let me let me check my notes here. No, really, that is the plot. You sure? Okay, then. Uh, anyway, in Spellbound, Morty Maxwell is trying to win all the spelling bees. Like, there's a national spelling bee tournament circuit, and he's in it, and he wants to win it, and I guess that there's the added complication of he's enrolling his own robots to also try and win it, which seems like that's a bit unfair, but also the robots are bad at it. Which could be a hilarious joke about the state of speech recognition, but it's also just the lowest stake scheme Morty Maxwell's been getting up to. Like, he's just entering the competition, and your aim is to just win the competition instead. The game consists of a series of spelling tests, either find a word or flashcards or crossword alike games, and even when you've successfully done enough drills, you can go to the event and try to win the spelling bee. 
The spelling bee then blows your mind with cool technology by having a number of the words being spoken so you can spell them. Some of them. So, uh... The game will, if you don't have the sound set up for it, flash you the word and then ask you to spell it, which I feel is a remarkably different kind of spelling challenge. Of course, there's an added difficulty for me as an Australian playing it, where this game will tell me that I've somehow spelled the word colour wrong. Going back and playing this game, I'm struck by how unnecessary it is, and yet how enjoyable better versions of it are. We love to play with words, but a dedicated game you have to run, and with this kind of interface, is an extremely mediocre way to do that. We all type things into interface, and if Wordle has shown me anything, it's that lots of people really like having a ready word game on hand to play. Spellbound was just ahead of its curve, and too American, and uh, I'm still trying to get over that plot. It, it's, it's just Morty trying to compete in the Spelling Bee tournament, and win it. That That's a thing good students do. Like, surely if you do it, you get praised, but if he does it, he sucks? Does... Does the US Spelling Bee Tournament Circuit command an immense political power I was hitherto unaware of? Gizmos and Gadgets and Mission Think Gizmos and Gadgets sees Morty Maxwell deploying squads of robots again, this time taking over the Shady Glen Technology Center, which is, you know, one of those cool science museums full of puzzles and stuff, where you get to play around with things like levers and pistons and gears. To oust Morty, you need to beat him in a sequence of races, which I guess is the second time since Ancient Empires Morty's been involved in race crimes. <clears throat> anyway, Gizmos and Gadgets is a collect em up game where you roam around a semi-random maze area, avoiding two different kinds of monkey robot, collecting the components that go into making a sick go-kart or personal zeppelin or airplane, high nixie, or whatever. So on the one hand, you have the building mechanic where you need to make a thing, then you have to understand what about the building mechanic matters. Does it matter if your biplane is blue or green? Does it matter how the wings are shaped? What wing types are better? What about the fuselage? Odds are good you know what's perfect if you're an adult, I assume, which means it's not difficult, but the difficulty comes from whether or not the pieces you want, the pieces you know are the best, are available. Do you go back into the warehouse to try and solve more puzzles that are again not challenging per se, to try and find the pieces to make your vehicle perfect? Do you care about spray painting? Do you want the sick Viper decal? Gizmos and Gadgets is notable because the play experience is reasonably slick. The puzzles are satisfying to solve, they're in a reasonable place, doors in a science center meant to make you play with that stuff, and the character moves at a decent pace. The game is in an endless loop the way Treasure Mountain is, and the conclusion is a conclusion. You beat Morty at 15 races and he, humiliated, leaves and tries to pedally steal your trophy on the way out the door. The asshole. Gizmos and Gadgets is definitely a slicker production than most of the other Super Solvers games. It's not peak gaming or nothing, but it's a game that has the feel of being made by people who had made a bunch of other games, and that those other games were getting better and better. There's a phenomenon when you watch the history of media and technology where the first attempts to use something are interesting but unpolished, and then later iterations build on that until the people who are trying things out move on to other things. You can see it in the last great pixel-based non-3D JRPGs where the last ones before Final Fantasy VII shook the world apart, were kind of all at a peak of complexity and conceptual depth. Gizmos and Gadgets is that game, that game just before the push of the dominance of a new operating system paradigm, Windows, DirectX, and then shortly after the impact of widespread adoption of the internet. On the other side of that line, Mission Think, it's slightly harder to get running on DOSBox now, and it's basically just a slightly crappier version of Gizmos and Gadgets, so I didn't bother. I think Mission Think might be a victim of being a made-for-CD game, where the turning of the years put the game at that awkward spot of PC game development, where middleweight game companies were given 600 megabytes to play with, and couldn't find anything to do with them after the first 14. It's not nearly as visually pleasant as the other lower resolution games, and the repeated use of voice clips makes everything kind of annoying. It doesn't look nearly as charming, and it feels like it's a first step on a new art style, rather than a refinement of an existing one. I don't know, it just kind of sucks. Oh wait, I mean, I mean, more like Mission Stink. Operation Neptune. I have a friend who I talk to about this game franchise a little bit over the years. Time to time I'll talk to her and offhandedly mention something about the game and she'll say something like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then I'll show her a screenshot from it and she'll foam and expectorate like I've just unlocked some kind of CIA activation code. Operation Neptune is possibly the least Super Solvers-y of the Super Solvers franchise, and it's kind of stapled on as a brand. 
In Operation Neptune, something falls out of space from a satellite and crash lands in the ocean. You have to go down in a math-powered submarine and pick up all the pieces, navigating through narrow caves in an environment full of deep sea life that is somehow capable of punching through your metal hull and destroying your oxygen supply. The game itself plays pretty well. It's mostly a game of navigating around the movement patterns of sea creatures, which you learn to identify. Each room is made of predictable patterns, and it's interrupted by broadcasts from the surface asking you to do math puzzles that are reasonably well framed for the things you need to know, like your air and ballast system or your mapping and heading. Operation Neptune is a game I think of very fondly. I like it, but I absolutely do not recommend you try it, and I do not think it's a game you should return to. See, the thing is, the game just doesn't have a difficulty curve. The last few levels of the game are about trying to recover the thing you've been slowly learning about, and the difficulty of the game here, and a number of other places earlier on, just jumps off a cliff. The game is incredibly unfair, and if you're an easily frustrated kid, or not an easily frustrated adult, or just a person, you'll probably be overwhelmed by the way the ending of the game just tells you, good job, try again now if you want. If you played this game, you probably never saw the way it ends. This is because statistically, the average playtime of Operation Neptune is 14 years. You know, you play it when you're a kid and you come back to it in your 20s and work out how it ended, and then you find that the ending is incredibly underwhelming. <laughs> So that's some, but not all, the things that the learning company did. It's just the peculiar core of one type of branding, and I'm glossing over some other games in the same space that weren't branded as Super Solver games. I've talked a little bit about why those games feel related or how they feel familiar to one another, but this isn't any kind of expert opinion. I don't have insight from inside. I just have an impression from the outside. It's a story. It's a story that makes sense to me, but it's just a story. Don't let the fact that I'm convincing make you believe it's true. Odds are good there are people who will be able to tell you it's completely wrong. People like the people who founded The Learning Company. The Learning Company was founded in 1980 by Anne McCormick, Leslie Grimm, Terry Pearl, and Warren Robinette. Of those names, Robinette's probably the one that leaps out at you, thanks to his cameo mention in the culture-shaping mega-hit movie Ready Player One, and also being one of the first recognized programmers to have hidden the secret in a game. Basically, the person who's responsible for the term Easter Egg being coined. This is what Robinette went on to do. The Learning Company is a brand with some history. It was founded in 1980 in California, and when they finally went public as a company, they did so with so robust a plan that they were able to deliver 16 consecutive quarters without a down quarter. The story ends in 1995 when the Learning Company was acquired by Softkey in a hostile takeover, along with their former rival companies Mech, who made Oregon Trail and Dino Park Tycoon, and Broderbund, who made the Carmen Sandiego games and missed. Then that story was wrapped up again in 1999, when Softkey was bought out by Mattel in what is historically considered one of the worst deals of all time, wiping out over $2 billion in shareholder value in one day. Except wait, that story was wrapped up again in 2000, when Mattel sold off the gutted brand at this point, after less than a full year of not doing anything with it, to a company called River Deep Interactive Learning, and finally wrapped up again in 2018 when Horton Mifflin Harcourt, the company that Riverdeep turned into, decided to stop publishing stuff under the learning company brand. That's the summary of what happened. That's the summary because I don't have sources on this. I can read public trading paperwork and announcements from companies like Softkey and Mattel, but it's all in a system that's deliberately designed to be boring to read and occasionally hard to decipher for people outside of the space. If you want, I can list the sequence of events, but I can't tell you the stories about it more than if you'd get it, you went and checked Wikipedia for yourself. What I found myself wanting was a book like Masters of Doom, a well-researched book with access to meaningful sources that could talk to the story of the history of the company as it was lived. If you're a writer with access to Warren Robinette, hey, you know, I'd buy a copy. I mean, it'd be nice to buy something related to the Super Solvers.